Welcome everybody uh, to this very first WIPIC webinar um, of what we hope to become um, a series of bi-monthly uh, webinars with uh, senior speakers, um, mentors if you, if you want, that will talk about things that are somewhat outside of the conventional uh, science related things and more on the career um, on subjects that are very important to young scientists and that are rarely discussed. Um, our first host, we're very proud, is um, or our first speaker uh, for this session is Leonard Martens. Um, we just asked him what he would like uh, to talk about um, and he came up with the idea of giving us a peek behind the curtain. What happens to your manuscript and to your grant after you've submitted it? Uh, I was very happy when he proposed this because indeed that is somewhat of a dark side for many young scientists and a very important part of the of the career. Without further ado, I would like uh, to leave the stand to uh, Leonard. We're going to have a look at what happens to your manuscript and what happens to your grant after you've submitted it. So essentially the view from uh, an editorial or a reviewer perspective or a grand panel perspective, uh, just uh, because that is very rarely uh, discussed in detail. So let's start with this uh, with this first slide, which is uh, a picture I found on uh, the internet. And actually, the attribution is wrong. Sorry, this uh, this is a copy paste mistake. Uh, I don't know who made this. Uh, picture. It's very hard to find out on the internet, but those of you who are familiar with Greek mythology might um, uh, remember this. This is Odysseus trying to get past uh, Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, Charybdis is the whirlpool to the left and Scylla is the multi-headed monster on the right. And uh, sometimes it feels like this when you submit your work for review, be it a manuscript or being a grant proposal, it looks like as if it can only go wrong and nevertheless you have to make it across to the other side. So knowing a little bit in advance of what awaits you, uh, what kind of monsters there are, uh, might help you on your journey. So the way I've structured this is in, uh, in six parts. So first on the manuscript side, submitting the manuscript, reviewing it, um, or having it reviewed, and then how does the editor make a decision? And then a very similar flow for the grant agency or the grant proposal, the submission, the review, and finally the panel ranking. So without further ado, let's have a look at the manuscript, shall we? So a manuscript typically contains three parts uh, and some associated metadata. So the three main parts are the manuscript text, which includes the abstract and of course the main text, and then uh, supplemental information and a cover letter. You can also in most cases assign preferred and non-preferred reviewers. So some journals even force you to specify preferred reviews. We'll come back to that. You can nearly always, or at least in any case I've ever submitted the manuscript, you can specify a non-preferred reviewer. Um, and then some journals actually ask you to also uh, assign a preferred editor. So you have to choose an editor that you think is, um, is capable of handling the manuscript or would be well suited to handling the manuscript. But that, that is in italics because that de depends very heavily on the, on the journal. Now, what happens with your uh, submission? So you've got a bunch of authors on the left, you've got their completed files and submission form. Usually that goes straight to the editor-in-chief in most journals. And the editor-in-chief does a quick check of whether everything is there. This may also, of course, be a, an assistant or a editorial assistant from the publisher. They go through the manuscript um, uh, form to see whether all the information is there. They check whether there's a manuscript attached, whether it has an abstract, whether it has the materials and methods and so forth. The layout is okay. And they briefly scan the cover letter to see what this thing is about. The reason why this is important is because the title, the abstract, and the uh, cover letter help the editor-in-chief assign an editor. Uh, so the actual editor that will handle the manuscript. Again, keep in mind, you may have suggested a preferred editor. Even in, so in those cases, they will first check whether that actually makes sense um, before they will assign it. So this process is already quite important. Um, and so I've got some points on that. So as I said, the, the cover letter, the abstract, and the title are really quite important at this stage. Um, it's, it's really quite crucial that you highlight the topic of your manuscript and the key points of your results. This will allow the editor to, uh, sorry, the editor-in-chief to assign the right editor for you. 
and it's very important to have the the right editor we'll, we'll talk more about that later um, you also need to make sure, and this is also uh, one of these things that is very often forgotten, that the abstract, the title, and the cover letter are quite consistent in what the topic is and what the key points are. Don't mention in the cover letter that the key point is X, and then have a title that is about Y, and then have in the abstract a lot of fuss about Z, because then whoever looks at this will already have a bad feeling about your text about your manuscript about your work so make sure all of this is quite consistent that there's a clear view on what the topic is what the key points are which will allow the editor-in-chief um, to choose the right editor for you now another thing that sets these three things apart is that abstract and title should normally be related to each other and should be scientific writing they should these things should be objective they should be about the work they should not Put in any opinions or any meta concepts. The cover letter, however, is very different. That's why it exists. It does allow you to describe these things. You can say why this is relevant, why you think that the readership of this journal will be interested in this um, subject matter, and what the potential impact of this work will be. And these are things you do not put in an abstract, but you should put them in the cover letter. Otherwise, if the cover letter is a copy paste of your abstract, you might as well not have submitted it. Now, this cover letter is important and these meta concepts are important because as soon as the editor in chief has assigned an editor, this editor is then going to assess whether your work has been correctly targeted to this journal. And this is a quite important thing. You do not want your manuscript to be rejected at the level of the editor because that means nobody actually ever read it and gave you feedback on it. And so that is, that is almost like as if it bounces off the armor of the journal. And that is really de determined, of course, again, by the title and the abstract, but also by the cover letter. It should show that you know the, what the readership of the journal is like, which kind of people read the journal. And of course, that will be very different between, say, bioinformatics or um, uh, the Journal of Proteome Research and Nature Methods. These have different audiences that are interested in different things, and they probably expect different kinds of impact as well. As a general rule, by the way, the higher the impact factor is, the more important it is to have the title, the abstract, and the cover letter done really well. Because the higher the impact factor, the more manuscripts are submitted to these journals, essentially. And the more manuscripts are submitted, the harder it is to for the um, editors to go through all the details. So they need to go quickly through what you have submitted and make a decision on the spot. And if your title, abstract, and cover letter are not helping them make that decision very quickly or not, um, and definitely if they're not helping uh, make that dis uh, decision in a positive way, then they will just reject it offhand. If you write a box standard cover letter that says, please find attached my manuscript concerning blah de blah, uh, so blah de blah being the title, thank you very much for considering uh, and submit that to Nature Methods, 99.9% .9 chance it comes straight back because you have not made a case for your manuscript. In fact, with these higher impact factor journals, they tend to have professional editors, so people who have a full-time job being an editor rather than being a voluntary editor, um, i.e. a scientist uh, uh, like anybody on this call or me or Martin. Um, that actually does this in their free time. These people have these high impact factor journals have professional editors, and the professional editors really do care about um, the the wording and the and the content of the cover letters. Um, they really take their time to go through this because usually they then have to defend in a second stage this manuscript against the other members of the editorial board. So they're um, their board of editors comes together and then they have to say, we want this to go forward in our extremely high impact factor journal because X, uh, preferably X, Y, Z, there's multiple reasons. And then other editors might say, no, 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 I don't think this is relevant for our journal because of this and that. And what you should be providing them with is ammunition to use in that discussion. So your cover letter should be making the points directly that you want them to convey at a meeting of other editors where other editors are trying to get the manuscripts they love in rather than yours. So really try to write, especially for high impact factor journals, a cover letter that argues the case 
for including your manuscript. And it definitely is not a bad idea to do the same for lower impact factor journals where this might be a little bit less important. At least you'll get a chance to practice your skills at selling your stuff there. So, but definitely remember um, that in higher impact factor journals, you really need to provide them with good arguments that they can almost translate literally. Okay, so what happens if you make it past the editor? Your manuscripts get sent out for review. And as you can see in the schematic, that's the editor that chooses the reviewers. So that's an important, uh, important thing to note because that shows you how important that editor is. That editor is going to be the one that assigns the reviewers and the reviewers are going to say pass or fail, essentially, for your manuscript. So, oops, so if we look into this, that... Um, the recruitment by reviewers is done by the network of the editor and based on the title and the abstract. And so this is my second point here. Um, what does this mean? The editor, of course, knows a lot of people in science. Uh, usually they're not starting PhD students, but they tend to be um, established researchers that have quite a network and some background. So whenever they see a manuscript title, they will immediately think, whom do I know that I can send this manuscript to and I will get a, a good review back. Um, of course, this may not always be the case or they might not know that many people and they're already handling manuscripts. So many of the websites that these editors use now have a, an automatic link that submit the title and the abstract to a search engine, a specialized search engine that then finds similar manuscripts. This is also a good reason for you to consider your title, especially your title carefully. If you PubMed or Google your title, what comes up as hits? Because these are likely the people that will be reviewing your manuscripts, okay? So the corresponding authors are the first authors on manuscripts that show up when you Google your own title. These might very well be invited to review your um, manuscript as well. And of course, what you want is interested and knowledgeable reviewers, interested because they will spend the time to really get to know your work, and knowledgeable because that's the only way you can get decent feedback. Um, as we mentioned before, you, <clears throat> you almost always get to assign preferred and non-preferred reviewers. Um, and almost always, the non-preferred category is strictly adhered to. If you say, this person should not be looking at my manuscript, then usually that is, that is set in stone and these people will not be invited. Um, however, there are exceptions. Uh, in our field, for instance, molecular and cellular proteomics has a policy that states that you cannot exclude associate editors of the journal um, as reviewers. So if there is a reviewer, uh, sorry, if there's an associate editor on MCP that you think should be excluded, then you're in trouble because you cannot. Okay, and they, they, so the editor can always overrule that. So make sure you know what the rules are there. Um, uh, heaven forbid you get this associate editor assigned as your editor, and then this person reads that you have excluded them um, as a reviewer, might not be good. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, the, the preferred category, so you, you actually su suggest people you think would be good as reviewers, they typically, so editors typically pick, pick one from that list. So they, they try to have three reviewers usually, so that's two external ones and one that you prefer. Um, experience, however, shows that your preferred reviewers tend to be the tough ones. Uh, these are your friends usually, these are people that you know or that you think could be very relevant. And since they know you as well, they tend to want to show extra how objective they are. And so they tend to go through, with a, through your manuscript with a fine comb and make your life um, quite difficult. So this is a general truth. Huh? So the, the preferred reviewers tend to be your most, uh, your most detailed reviewers. However, they might be tough. They tend to be constructive as well. And I'll come back to that on the, on the next bit when we talk about the reviewers themselves. So take home messages here is um, our make sure to use the preferred and non-preferred reviewers um, if necessary, the latter category. Uh, check your title in Google because the stuff that shows up or in PubMed and the stuff that shows up uh, is written by people who might be your reviewers. And um, uh, make sure to keep in mind that your preferred reviewers can be pretty tough on you as well. Okay, so when we think about reviewing, um, you might want to do as many reviews as possible. You might become invited as well um, to review manuscripts. Uh, I would say if you're at an early career stage, try to say yes as often as possible. 
Um, this because you will get to know the editors and the editors get to know you. It's hard for editors to find reviewers. Uh, so a lot of people don't make the time anymore to review. So if you actually get to know the editors, um, that's nice for you, but they start to realize that you provide in time nice reviews and uh, nice being useful for the editor in this case. And that definitely helps when you submit manuscripts later. Okay, so definitely um, do that. It's good for your network. Second, and this is very important as well, you learn how you read other people's manuscripts. You learn what you like and what you don't like when you read a submitted manuscript. And to be honest, other people tend to be like you, which means that what you like and what you don't like can be translated to what other people like and don't like. So if you come across a really well-written manuscript and you want to say, okay, maybe one or two minor suggestions, but please, please publish this because it's amazing. Take the time as a reviewer to consider why am I coming to this conclusion? What was so brilliant about this manuscript that made me like it a lot? Because if you can emulate that in your next manuscript, then your manuscript will get accepted very easily as well. Conversely, if you read something and it just boils your blood and you want to write the worst review ever, to say that this manuscript should be shredded rather than done anything else with. Um, consider why you are reacting like that. What is it about this manuscript that you don't like? Very often you'll find it's lack of structure, a clear lack of topic, or a clear lack of key achievements. These kind of things make it very difficult, but there might be other things. And so by reviewing and by actually spending the time to consider why you're reviewing in a certain way, you will learn a lot about how to write a good manuscript. So uh, as I mentioned, editors are always looking for good reviewers. Uh, good reviewers are rare, so people who will actually take the time to do a good job. And once they've established a, a group of reviewers, uh, they consider these people extremely valuable and they will make use of these reviewers a lot. Uh, but you will have an editor friend as well, which is always nice. Um, finally, reviewing currently is a really strange activity because it doesn't actually bring you anything on your CV. Um, if you write manuscripts, that's good for your CV. If you give presentations, that's good for your CV. If you get grants, that's good for your CV. But if you review papers, that doesn't really show up anywhere in academic rankings. So that is why it's so hard to get people to review um, manuscripts. Having said that, I told you that you actually do get something out of it. You learn a lot from reviewing manuscripts. The second thing is, there are some initiatives out there um, that are trying to get people to obtain credit for the reviewing that they do. So they try to give you a, a, a kind of an account where you can show how often you've reviewed and then you accumulate some kind of uh, points on that account. Uh, that might even be tied in with an editor's evaluation. Editors can actually evaluate reviews and usually they are asked to do that. So if I'm an editor, I get a review back. I read the review at the bottom. It says, how would you rate this review? Is it a good review or a bad review? So if you make too many bad reviews, then you won't show up as a potential reviewer anymore because, you know, it seems that all the editors hate your reviews. But if your reviews are always good, then, of course, you're doing a good job. You might get more invites. And you could weigh your contribution to the reviewing by this quality score. So you could say you get one point for reviewing times a percentage from zero to 100 percent, depending on how good that review was perceived by the uh, editor how useful, right? So when I say good in this context, I mean how useful for the editor in making a final decision. Um, these things are still being set up. There's nothing clear out there yet. Um, but I would still advise you, especially if you're an early career researcher, on your CV, put sentences like reviewer for and then the name of the journal. And if you do this often, if you've done more than three reviews in a year, put down frequent reviewer for and then a journal because it helps when people look at this and say, oh, okay, so you get invited a lot by this journal to do reviews. And I like this journal, which means that you do good reviews, which probably means you're not a bad scientist. So definitely make sure to put that on your CV, even though it doesn't give you any form of credit um, anywhere. It does help. And it's a very simple sentence to add. And especially if you have quite a lot of journals or higher impact factor journals, that always looks impressive. Okay. So, reviewing. So once the reviews are done, 
They come back to the editor. Again, they come to the editor. So again, this crucial role of this person, the editor. That's why I told you it's very important to get the right editor for your stuff. The reviewers submit everything to the editor. And then the editor makes a call. The editor is going to make a decision. So let's have a look at this process in detail. So the editor's state of mind about your work matters. If the editor started off thinking, wow, this is really cool research. I really would like to have this in my journal. That is very different from, let's see if this flies. You know, let's see if anybody thinks this is actually any good. You can see what the difference is here. You can, with the first type of mindset from the editor, you can weather a lot more critical reviews than with the second one. If the second mindset is there and one reviewer says, I don't like this, that's it, your manuscript is coming back with a reject. If it's the first mindset and one reviewer says, I don't like this, then the editor is going to read the other review in a lot of detail as well to see whether there might not be some kind of issue there or whether there could be something that is salvageable. So the editor's state of mind matters. And the editor's state of mind, of course, depends on how familiar they are with the context in which you're working with the topic of course, with the value of your work, but also with the clarity of the presentation. So again, if they get a really good idea of what you're doing and what has come out of this, it's easier for them to come up with a good idea about, what, uh, about whether or not they like this. Now, second thing, and this is also important when you're reviewing, is that whatever you put in the reviewer report is potentially less important than the style in which you write it. You can write a constructive review, which says, well, I found this issue, but if you do that, you can fix it. Or it can be destructive, which is like, there's this glaring issue here that completely destroys the work uh, without offering a means to, to fix it. And I've, I've noticed in my experience over the many years that this style of the review may matter more than the actual comments. I mean, I've had reviewers that gave me four pages of, of comments, serious comments, but they were all constructive. And the editor said, yeah, go ahead. You know, it's a, it's a major modification, but go ahead. I've had other that make one or two comments that are very destructive, where there's no, where the, the reviewer gives no um, indication that this situation can be salvaged and you just get a reject. So the way you write things really makes a difference. And you want your reviewers to write constructive comments as a result. Um, of course, as you will probably know, the reviewers tend to also have the option to uh, advise the editor, not you necessarily, although some type it in their reviews, it's not, you're not supposed to, to accept um, to have minor or major revisions or to reject the manuscript. Um, there's another thing that I haven't put on my slide, but I should have, which is that the reviewers actually also have a box where they can type confidential comments to the editor. So for instance, if they say, I think this work is a copy of an earlier work, yeah, so this, this might be, uh, or I think fraud happened, or um, these guys have submitted the same manuscript to another journal, um, and I've reviewed that one as well, which actually happens because, you know, uh, remember the Googling of the title, you tend to get the same kind of people that review manuscripts, so don't ever do that. You're also not supposed to. Um, but suppose that you notice something like this, you can always type it in the uh, um, confidential comments to the editor. So the editor will know about this. It may not be in the review, but the editor knows about this. So there is a, a, a channel for the reviewer to communicate directly with the editor without you ever knowing about this. Now, an editor can then go the safe route with these, uh, with these comments. And a lot of editors tend to do that. They choose a kind of average score. So if you have one minor revision and one major revision, you get a major revision. If you get one reject and one major revision, you get a reject. Uh, it gets difficult if you get a minor revision and a reject. Then the mindset of the editor really matters. Does the editor think there is value here to begin with? Then that might result in a major revision or even a minor revision. If the editor says, you know what, the second reviewer is not making very solid points. Um, I'm just going to tell you to ignore that. So that's the second bit. So the editor can step in with their own opinion. I've done that as an editor. I've had um, cases where I found where I got one really nasty, really negative, really destructive review, and two other ones that were major revision or minor revision. And it was very obvious that the person who wrote the really nasty review had a, had some kind of beef with the people doing the research or with the research. And these were not really scientific comments. These were just, uh, for some reason, I hate this work because it gets in my way kind of comments. Uh, and then an editor can have, definitely can have an opinion and can say, I'm going to ignore that. So ultimately the decision is the editor's 
decision. The editor just needs to feel backed up by the reviewers. Uh, if three reviewers say reject and the editor says minor revision, there's a problem, of course. Right, so now you understand a little bit the dynamic and it's, you can also understand why if you're a frequent reviewer for the journal and the editor likes you as a reviewer and knows that you write decent, solid reviews, the editor is going to have a more positive state of mind about your work. So if one of the um, reviewers gives you some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of fluff for, for doing something not exactly the way they like it, you'll be off to a better start. Um, uh, than if the editor would not know you at all. Having said that, again, the editor is not going to let shoddy science slip past the radar, right? It's not because they know you that suddenly bad work gets, gets published. It's rather the opposite. If they know you or if they like your work or both, they might have shoddy reviews and shove them to the side more readily. Um, and so that's what I said at the bottom as well. If the editor really likes your work because they got a good impression of it because you sold it well uh, this is usually beneficial it can turn a uh, iffy situation in a good situation but again no silver bullet if the work is shoddy you will not get it published right so the editor then makes their decision so that could get that could be an average of what is given by the reviewers or could have a little bit more of the uh, of the editor's own choice in there and then they send that back usually to the editor-in-chief who then forwards the decision to the authors um, it may be that the editor sends it in directly but usually the editor-in-chief has to rubber stamp it um, i've not known of any case where the editor-in-chief actually intervened in the decision because usually this is impossible there are just too many manuscripts going through the pipeline for the poor editor-in-chief to be um, to be on the level with all of these things so what happens when you get your comments back so regardless of the outcome you'll definitely learn a lot from the comments. If they're positive, if they're negative, um, they will definitely tell you stuff. They, this stuff may be about your work. There may be tips and tricks in there. Maybe try this, maybe try that. Uh, and of course, if you have a revision, you will have to take care of that. Uh, if you have a reject, this might also be very useful. Um, but the second thing you should also um, look at is how did these people perceive your text? Because you have a certain idea a certain thing you're trying to sell. If you don't find that idea back in the reviewer comments, then maybe you have not written the manuscript correctly. And this is something that a lot of people ignore. They say, ah, but this comment does not make any sense because this person completely did not understand the manuscript. And then for the second reviewer, if you can say the same thing, then maybe you, you misstated your research in the text. And that's why they didn't get it. Uh, or however, if two of them get it and one does not get it, it's usually not your fault. But definitely pay attention to this because it is hard to communicate clearly. You have to learn how to do this. And you can learn how to do that from looking at the, uh, at the overall context of the, of the reviews you get back. Now, this, um, the other thing is that perception is important. When you read the review comments, do you feel like as if these people are being constructive or are they dismissive? If they are destructive, either they have beef with you or your work, or again, there might be something wrong with the manuscript. If people are encouraging, that usually is a good sign. Even if you get rejected, yeah, that's a good sign. That means there's something there. They might give you good tips. It also means that they got what you're trying to tell them. So definitely be, be, be uh, attuned to these kind of things. Um, and then, of course, very importantly, if somebody really gets on their horse about something, learn what makes them unhappy. Now, as I said before, typically this is lack of structure, lack of clarity, lack of key goals. Um, if they are unhappy with a particular um, bit of the science, of course, that's a different thing. Then you might have done something wrong uh, or you might have a discussion about something where somebody does not believe your method, but you do. And then you need to give them more evidence that uh, your method works. But if it's not about the core work that you have done, then definitely be careful with that. Um, match that with the, uh, the, the reviewing that you do. Uh, so that you can learn what makes reviewers unhappy and then avoid that as the, like the plague in the future. Now, something that you should also remember is that you can always appeal to a decision. And you can always send an email back to the editor-in-chief or to the editor and say, I disagree with this decision. Uh, the, I've used this to good effect a few times in my career, but only a few times. It's only when it's absolutely obvious that somebody got it very wrong. So use it sparingly. If you're going to fight off every decision, um, every time, I mean, the journal is going to stop re start rejecting your manuscripts offhand because you're just being a pain, right? Um, but if you really do have 
incorrect comments where the reviewers completely missed it uh, or uh, the reviewers are unqualified this happens this uh, this can happen it means that you had a poor editor poorly suited editor i'm sorry with the wrong network or with the wrong background or you may also have had a poor title that that uh, led to the identification of the wrong type of reviewers. Um, if you have something like this and you can, you can argue against it, then definitely, by all means, try to make an appeal and always suggest a remedial action in the appeal. Say, it's clear that this and this and this did not get across, so what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this, this and this, and we would like a second chance. Uh, never just say, these people are idiots, give me a second chance. Always say, this and this might be my mistake, so I'm going to fix that. Again. You have to give the people who are looking at your appeal something to work with, right? Um, and again, use this sparingly. What you should remember is that the editors and the reviewers are all scientists too. They all care about science. They all know what it's like to publish. So usually, they tend to be on your side. And you should be like that too. When you are a reviewer or uh, an editor, Take into account that the people who are trying to get their manuscripts, their work published, their manuscripts submitted and evaluated, um, try to be as constructive as possible. Think about the kind of stuff you would like to hear. So there's nothing wrong with rejecting a manuscript while being very constructive and saying this, this, and this does not work. I think you could make it better by doing so and so. It takes a little bit more effort, um, but it's usually worth it. Uh, I try to do that as much as possible myself. The only times when I don't do this is when a manuscript is a complete and utter mess and it took me two hours to get through the abstract. If you have a manuscript like that that just does not make any sense because it's too complicated, I would just say, this is extremely poorly written. I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're on about, so please try again. Rewrite the whole thing. Um, a second thing is if the English is, is really bad, um, then even a structured manuscript can become very cryptic. And that too is usually a, a, a reason not to give too constructive a criticism. Although the constructive criticism then tends to be find somebody who speaks English or writes English better and, and you know, get them involved because this isn't going anywhere. But apart from these two rare cases, which practically never happen, um, I would warmly advise you to always try and be constructive because most of the people are constructive and huh? reviewing is not about finding every last little mistake and hammering it home it's about looking at other people's work and think is this decent and how can we make it better right so that's all i had to say about manuscripts uh, in general um, now let's look at submissions of grants, which are very similar in many ways, but there are a few key differences. So I'll focus predominantly on the differences, but a lot of the stuff that I said about manuscripts goes here as well. Write structured ways, write clearly, write decent English, this kind of stuff stays important. So a grant proposal also roughly has three important bits. So you have the proposal text with all the nitty gritty, you have your CV, and you have the summary. So usually there's a lay summary, which the funding agency likes to publish on their website, um, and a scientific summary, which is really, really important because that essentially introduces the whole grant to everybody who starts reading it. Um, and then you have preferred and non-preferred reviewers. Usually you can, you can specify those as well. Uh, it may be the case that this is completely handled by the funding agency. Uh, and then you have a panel or topic that you can select. So for instance, if there are multiple calls, you can say this is a manuscript that goes in for that call, or this is one that is about fundamental science rather than applied science or whatever. So th there's usually some kind of choice to be made as well. So if we look at how this works, the app is very similar to journals. You submit to the funding body and the funding body then channels this to the panel or to the chair of the panel. Um, but the funding body usually does a quick checkup. So they go through your proposal to see whether it's all fine so for instance um, they check whether you have the uh, a budget whether you have an abstract whether you have uh, the method section where it should be um, it looks at whether you have the Gantt chart if you need one um, and if you're lucky they may even check whether you follow the template or whether you went over uh, over the allotted space now first thing to remember is this stuff is important because some funding agencies will take a miss submitted um, uh, grant proposal so something went wrong and they'll just throw it in the bin that's it i mean you've done all your work for nothing that doesn't happen very often but it can happen so remember that you can always ask these nice people whose job it is to help you get funding they don't care about 
you as an individual, they care about giving funding to the best scientist and you might be that scientist. They don't know, so they don't judge you. So you can always phone them or email them and ask them for information. If you're unsure about anything, just email them or phone them. Uh, in my experience, I've always had extremely positive, extremely constructive interactions with these funding agencies. They're really there to help you. So they're not evil. They're not um, out there to get you. These people are probably the most friendly people in the entire um, system because they're just there to make your job easier. So definitely make sure you, you, do, uh, you make use of that when you're unsure about something. Um, Something is really cool these days with the uh, online systems is that uh, many systems allow repeated submissions. Horizon 2020, for instance, allows that. And uh, only the last one you submitted actually counts. So this is really great because you can start submitting a grant at a late draft stage. And, you, and it feels really great once you've submitted the first version, you think, okay, something is in now. Even if I suddenly get the flu or get hit by the bus, something will be looked into. And then you refine it and then you submit again and then you refine it a bit more and you submit again and you will notice that your stress levels drop because you have a pretty good grant submitted and then you start tweaking it. And if you're not careful, you're going to be tweaking it to the very last minute because you get, it's really nice to be tweaking something that's finished rather than having to work towards finishing something. So psychologically, this repeated submission process, in my case at least, has always helped me write better grants because I submit early and then the stress goes away. And when the stress goes away, I think more clearly, I look at my, uh, I look at my proposal differently, I tweak things and then I keep submitting and finding little mistakes, little errors, and then fixing that and submitting again. And it becomes fun to submit. Um, very important, make sure to adhere to all the rules concerning proposal length. There are agencies out there like Horizon 2020, if you get a 60 page limit and you provide 65 pages, they just cut off the last five pages. So anything that's on these last five pages is gone and your text will stop in the middle of something on page 60 and they will not let you know. They tell you in advance though, they tell you that this happens, but you know, if you haven't read the rules. So don't do that. Don't think, oh, all right, I'll put an extra page and they'll read it anyway, because it might very well be that they cut it off. Also, when you copy paste this into text boxes on a website, uh, the text boxes might just cut off the last bit. I've seen that very many times. So, and then if you're doing this quickly, you might not notice. So definitely make sure to adhere to proposal length rules. Uh, second thing is, I'm a reviewer on a lot of grants. I really hate reading, reading very, very long grant proposals. So sometimes if there's a 15 page limit and you get a 12 page proposal, that's the best proposal of the day because you only need to read 12 pages. So keep that in mind. You don't necessarily need to impress anyone with the length of your proposal. Impress with clarity and impress with purpose. Uh, similar to that, adhere to the templates. People usually get, uh, give you templates, funding agencies give you templates. These are not designed to hinder you. They're designed to make sure that you have a good flow through your proposal and they provide uniformity to the panel members and reviewers so that these people at least know where things are uh, when they need to discuss something. So definitely adhere to these templates. Learn about what these templates ask of you because they are actually really useful in helping you structure your work. I'll come back to that on the next uh, bit as well. Um, and then finally, do submit on time. Uh, I, again, systems that allow repeated submission, start submitting early because you can always overwrite. Take into account the time zone you're submitting to. Yeah, thank God in Europe, we tend to have a single time zone, but you know, UK and Portugal do not. Uh, and further east uh, might also not um, have the same time zone. So make sure what, to know what time zone it is. If it's an NIH grant, check what the time zone is there and look at the deadline. Is it midnight? Is it 5 p.m.? Is it 12 noon? Uh, make sure you know these kind of things because you, know, you would not be the first nor the last to suddenly realize at 11, a, uh, PM that the deadline was at 5 PM. Okay. That would be really bad rather than midnight. Um, and of course, uh, the closer you get to the deadline, the more people are constantly submitting stuff, which means that the systems can slow down or even go down when the deadline approaches. So if you're early, you definitely have something in again, multiple submission systems. They're really useful because you can submit two weeks in advance and then submit a version three times every day from then onwards. 
Right, now, how does your grant get reviewed? Here there's a crucial difference with, uh, for many of the funding agencies compared to how journals work. It is not the panel that invites the reviewers. The reviewers are invited by the funding body. They can either take into account your specified preferred reviewers or they might ask external people. But the bottom line is that the funding body invites the reviewers. If the reviewers are uh, distinct from the panel, then the panel will review as well. Okay, so um, it's, it's obvious that a subset of the panel members will always read your proposal. They are assigned readership of your proposal. There's nothing you can control about that apart from assigning the right kind of keywords and having a good title, um, but it depends on the process. Sometimes these will just be assigned by the funder to panel members. Sometimes the panel members can choose, can say, I like this one because it's in my field. So again, a good title helps, good keywords help, a good abstract might help. Same as with the manuscript. Um, nearly always external reviewers are also asked to provide a review on your grant. Um, it may be that the panel is completely composed of external reviewers, so these two become the same. It could be that the panel are local people and the external reviewers just provide their input to the local panel, that depends. Um, Always keep in mind that when it comes to grants, it's not like with manuscripts. It's not one reviewer, one manuscript, take the afternoon to read it. The reviewer gets assigned or the panel member gets assigned eight or nine grant proposals, um, which means good summaries are absolutely crucial. If the reviewer or the, the panel member reading the grant does not know on the first page really the entire outline of your work. What, why are we doing this? Why is this important? And roughly what are the objectives? If they don't know that, then there's a high probability they will not give your grant a good score because they read too many in a row. It has to be clear from the outset what's happening and then you provide additional detail as you go along simply because these people are overwhelmed, okay? So second thing then is have the content of your grant proposal, the actual text, fit the headers of the section in the template. If it says objectives, don't provide another three quarters page of background. The background should have gone in the background section. If it says objectives, it should start with the overall goal of my work is blah. And I'm going to do it through so many steps, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah, which you will find in detail in the work plan. So this is how this should be written so that when the reviewers read these things, the right bits are in the right places. That's also because they tend to fill in a, a review box that has um, all of these sections listed and they will ask people, is the background correctly provided? Uh, is the, uh, are the objectives clearly stated? And they would, it, it really helps if you can go to the relevant section in, in the filled out template and say, are the objectives relevant? Let's have a quick look at those objectives again. And I actually find objectives there. So I don't have to go and look for this as a reviewer because then it's, uh, it's problematic. And if it's problematic, I'll say, it's very hard to find out what the objectives are. And then your grant does not get funded, okay? Also, as I said before, the templates allow a logical flow. So what is out there right now? This is background. What are your objectives? This is the problems that you've outlined in the background, how you're going to, uh, sorry, what you're going to do to, to, uh, to fix them, which ones you're going to fix. Uh, and then the uh, work plan that follows is, uh, this is how I will do it, okay? And again, by the time any reviewer gets to the point where they read how you're going to do stuff, they're more or less already convinced on whether or not they think it's a good idea to start with. If they don't think it's a good idea, that's it. They probably won't even read the work plan in detail. So again, it's very important to be upfront about this, to say, this is the problem. This is a serious problem because of blah. I'm going to try and address this problem and I'm going to roughly do it like this. And then as a reviewer, I should be hooked and I should want to know how are you going to do this? And then I'll read the work plan. And then we can discuss whether or not you're doing the right thing to fix the right problem. But if you don't convince me that you've got the right problem and you've got the right overall approach, I'm going to reject it. Yeah. So the work plan is going to be, yeah, we, we might discuss about methods, but when I don't believe in the concept, I'm going to reject it. And again, this is really written in the summaries. Don't underestimate the lay summary. The lay summary should be the overall, the big thing. It should be about, um, we need to do this because it's super important for that without much further ado. Uh, and, I, and maybe I'm the person to do it. 
the, the scientific summary should then be more technical, should be about this is what we want to do, as we mentioned above, essentially. Um, this is how I'm going to tackle it. And here are some details so that you have a good idea of what my key points will be. And the outcomes will be such and such. Yeah. Okay. And then um, be careful as well when you, uh, when you can propose preferred reviewers because there's usually a lot of rules about potential conflicts of interest and make sure to adhere to these. So very often you cannot have published with these people in the last so many years. So make sure that you don't suggest people that violate that rule because some agencies will hold that against you. Uh, and definitely then there's no point in providing these people because they will be kicked off your list anyway. Okay, right. So let's get to the, the nasty bit, which is the panel ranking. So the reviewers send their reviews back to the funding body uh, and the, the panel also has their internal reviews if they're uh, additional to the reviewers. So similar to manuscripts, the tone of a review matters a lot. Is the reviewer saying, this is actually a very good idea. I think there might be some issues here, but they can take care of that, right? I'll, if I, I'll provide them feedback and they'll fix it as they, um, as they go through the motions or are they going to say you know these methods are completely incorrect um, these people completely underestimate the amount of work um, the, the the objectives are not clear uh, the objectives are old-fashioned there's nothing new here so that the tone of that review matters more than maybe a list of comments if, if they say yeah but these comments are fine they'll take care of that uh, once they they read this they'll know how to take care of it then that's a much better review than that has only one comment on the technical details but that says the premise is stupid okay very important in this is that you'll want at least one of the panel members ready to fight for your project. Because if they don't want to fight for your project, you're probably not going to get funding. The problem is there's not enough money to go around. Yeah, that's, what, that's what's in my title here. There, is, there are more good grants than there is funding. If nobody fights for, for your grant, then they'll fight for all the other grants. And then these guys get the money and you will not get the money. So you want to impress somebody on that panel member. And the way to do that is by writing a very clear, a very well-structured, a very good grant. But that's what you really should aim for. Convince these people. And remember what I said about the cover letter to the editor? That the editor was, should be able to uh, defend your manuscript against other editors? This is exactly the same thing. This panel member needs to be able to fight for your grant by working with the other um, uh, panel members and so you need to give these people good arguments and a good a well-written grant proposal has these kind of arguments in the grant proposal okay so as i said it's crucial to make it easy to understand your grant nobody will support a grant that is poorly structured i mean this is a general rule a poorly structured grant is lost yeah? because even if it is a very good scientific concept people will just take offense at the fact that they spend too much time trying to get through it and there's not enough money for all the grants so this is a great way to get rid of a grant if two or three people say i had a hard time reading this that's it it's over you're not even being discussed anymore of course, the science should be solid too. If anybody can point out scientific or scholarship issues, you didn't cite the right work, uh, you're completely oblivious to some other stuff that's going on, uh, or you may have done, you, you propose mice experiments, but you're working on Arabidopsis, you know, this kind of stuff. If you do something like that, of course, it gets, um, the proposal gets uh, pushed off the table. Now, the main problem actually in these kind of panels is not the triage between what do we think is fundable and what is not fundable. That's pretty easy. The problem is all of the fundable grants, from which of these are we actually going to give money? And so that's picking the winners. And honestly, that usually boils down to the preferences of the panel members. If you happen to be so unlucky as to be promoting a project where none of the panel members really cares about, that's it. And you're probably not going to get the funding. So there's, a, there's an element of luck involved, necessarily so. Yeah? Imagine 100 proposals come in, um, 40 of these are deemed fundable, but they can give money to 10. How do you pick 10 out of 40? That is very, very tricky. And that is why you want to have at least one of the panel members to fight for your grant. So that when people start ranking things, somebody will say, no, no, this should be higher ranked because, right? And this is really the fundamental thing. Can you get somebody to fight for you? And again, you get that by writing the right kind of proposal and by being a bit lucky. There's very little you can do about that. If, none of the, if you're a bioinformatician like me and none of the panel members is a bioinformatician, there's a low probability anybody will fight for your grant. Tough luck, better luck next time. 
Okay, so that can happen. Keep in mind, again, the panel members are not there to harass you. They don't do this out of ill will. They have to pick 10 winners out of 40. This is killing them. They would like to give everybody the money. They can't. It's one of the toughest and most annoying and most frustrating jobs in the universe to pick a winner because you always pick losers at the same time and you actually do think these people should not be losers. But that's the way it works, okay? So don't hate these people on the panels if they don't fund you. Um, that probably just means that there was somebody better out there, better according to them, okay? So finally, everything comes back to the funding body and the funding body gets a recommendation from the channel, or from the, from the um, panel or from the panel chair that says this, this is the ranking. So they say essentially these are fundable, these are not fundable and the fundable ones, they're ranked top one, second one, third one, all the way down. This is important because that funding body actually uh, decides who gets the funding. So the panel will suggest who gets funded but budget considerations and possibly equal spread principles can change things at the level of the funder. So the funder might say, wait a minute, I've got two proposals, two projects from the same PI, and they both are ranked uh, in a funding rate. I am not going to give two grants to the same person. This may, may apply. I'm not saying this is usual. This may apply. And so they might actually reject one of the two simply because you already got the other one. Uh, so these kind of things can really change up the recommendations from the panel which means that any unofficial communication you've had with panel members, which you usually should not have, but then again, this happens, um, may therefore ultimately provide incorrect expectations. So the panel member will tell you, oh yeah, you're ranked second, you will definitely get this money. Turns out that maybe for whatever reason, there isn't enough money or the ranking uh, was misunderstood or whatever, or the funding board decided to do something different and you don't get the money. Uh, when that happens, it's really, really bad. It's really bad. You may have already started hiring people for crying out loud. It turns out you don't get the money. Uh, the inverse is slightly less bad when they tell you that, you, sorry, you're not going to get it. And then suddenly you get a letter saying, yeah, you got the money. Um, that's always nice. That could happen in case of budget surplus. Um, maybe they, they had a bit more money um, left over than they thought, or they get more from the government or whatever. Or it could mean... Um, that if you apply for a fellowship, somebody who was ranked higher than you actually refused the fellowship because they got a better opportunity elsewhere. That actually happens a lot. The best people tend to apply for multiple fellowships, the one more prestigious or better than the other. Since they're very good people, they tend to get all of these, so they also get the impressive ones. So if they can choose between a local postdoc or a Marie Curie postdoc, they'll take the Marie Curie, reject the local postdoc, which then goes to the runner-up. So for fellowships, it's important to be well-ranked uh, because very often there's a, a runner-up who gets a position there. Uh, that doesn't apply to grants because nobody rejects project grants, at least not that I know of. Okay, so um, always take the comments to heart that people provide to you. It's exactly the same thing as with the manuscript. You learn a lot from that. Um, you can have been unlucky with an otherwise good grant. There's still always something to learn on how to make it better and how to improve your chances next time. Uh, and this is also true for manuscripts, but more so for grants because you pour a lot more of, your, of yourself in there because these are plans that you have. They're somehow more emotionally connected to you than manuscripts are because that's usually also a multi-person task. Um, give these comments some time. Don't read them immediately and then never read them again. Read them again in a week's time. When your brain has, has slowed down, when you, have, when you have distanced yourself from this, read them again. Maybe a month later, read them again, especially if this is one of your first grants. Give it time, let it cool down, let the emotion evaporate, then read them again and read them rationally. Have somebody else read them and tell you what they think. This kind of stuff is really useful, okay? So don't let your emotions get in the way of learning a good, uh, a good lesson here um, in these kind of things. Um, and again, the comments show you how the proposal was perceived. How do other people read your proposal is might be very different from how you thought you wrote it. But you know, if other people are insisting that they read it like X, they are right. Yeah? So you have to change the way you write it up. Um, and of course, look at your summaries, look at the comments. You will find out that the overall comments that usually make or break a proposal are derived almost directly from what's in the summaries. So it shows you how important the summaries are. If you don't have a nice summary, 
then you will not get the grant. So really spend time on the summaries. Don't do this as an afterthought or as a quickie to say, oh, I'll just type up some general stuff that kind of summarizes the thing. Work on this text. This text wins the reviewer over yeah? and the panel member that needs to fight for you. Okay, with that, let's come to the end. I hope to have provided you a little bit of a map. Um, historically, uh, uh, Scylla and uh, Charybdis were supposed to be located uh, between Sicily and Italy. Uh, somebody made this beautiful uh, book-based work of art, cut up the Odysseia for the purpose. Um, but hopefully I've been able to do the same by showing you what is really behind this. You now know what is ahead of you. And uh, I'm very happy to take any questions that you guys may have. Thank you very much. I imagine that to everybody, uh, manuscripts are um, um, a reality, a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, writing grant proposals, maybe uh, many of you haven't done that yet, but I think uh, there was a lot of valu valuable uh, pointers in there. Um, and, and one thing that I might want to add is that when I each time write a manuscript or a grant, it also helps me to structure uh, my own ideas, my own head. It's uh, it's not something you want to start at um, easily, but once you get in the flow and everything falls into places, it's actually a very sensible thing to do. So um, we don't have that much time left, but let's take out, um, I've tried to structure the questions a bit from my side. Um, now, one of the first things um, I wondered is, is why would somebody exclude uh, a reviewer? Uh, apart from the fact that you just hate his guts is there any other reasons why you want to exclude somebody yeah so hating somebody's guts is a really good reason um but a much better reason is if they hate your guts yeah. um it might be that you hate their guts but they're still nice to you uh, but you might have people you've had a beef with right i mean this happens um uh, people you've had discussions with people who have made very nasty comments uh, at a talk you gave uh, because it shows that they really don't care about your work so you want to exclude those. Second, competitors. When you write a grant proposal, you're actually giving away everything you're planning to do in the future. And so you really want to make sure that um, a, com a direct competitor does not get detailed insight into exactly what you're doing. So that's the one thing I use this for. If I know somebody who's working on very similar things, I, I want them excluded from the reviews because otherwise they'll steal my ideas. And nothing is more easily stolen than a grant proposal because a good grant proposal tells you exactly what you need to do to get a few nice papers out. And I've had this happen to me. I've seen people write manuscripts where the abstracts of the manuscripts were essentially the, the work packages that I wrote in grant proposals. Um, this kind of stuff happens. Uh, some people don't even do it consciously. They just uh, happen to read this and then six months down the line, they suddenly have a great idea. Turns out the great idea was what you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they might have forgotten. So um, competitors and people who really don't like you, um, that's the only reason why you would exclude someone. <clears throat> okay. Um, and another question uh, with the reviewers again is, is if you want to become a reviewer yourself, um, uh, how, how is the way to, to attract manuscripts to come your way? Is there anything you can do yourself? Yeah, there's, there's actually uh, several things you can do. The first thing, of course, is write manuscripts. If you write and submit manuscripts, editors will know who you are. They'll know what your topics are of interest and they'll, uh, they'll be able to find you. Also, as soon as you submit a manuscript, you have to register as an author. Um, as soon as that happens, you're actually in the reviewer database for that journal. Um, that's, that's a funny thing that happens. It's the same with grant proposals, by the way. Uh, and then the other thing that you can do is talk to PIs. Talk to your own PI or maybe neighboring PIs because people uh, like myself don't have a lot of time to do reviews. So what do I do when somebody sends me a nice manuscript to review? I tend to reject and then, and then suggest an alternate reviewer. And then I suggest somebody from my group or somebody that I know. Um, and if you let people know, you know, I would love to review, then um, that is really, really helpful. And then finally, the very obvious thing is if you know editors from journals, um, speak to these people at meetings if you can find them. Tell them, hello, I'm so-and-so, I do this kind of work, I would love to do, get some reviewing experience, and uh, if you ever need a reviewer for topic X, can you please think of me, here's my card. 
as I said, they usually have a hard time finding reviewers to find an enthusiastic young person who says, I would like to review. That usually works, uh, works wonders. Um, but definitely ask your PI or ask neighboring PIs that if they ever get invites that they don't want, that they forward them to you. These two things will get you uh, reviews sent to you very quickly, I think. There's, there's one more question here. Uh, what is a useful review uh, to the editor uh, or for an editor? So um, it's, it's clear what a review should uh, look like, but is there like an extra thing that should be considered when reviewing a paper? What kind of information is especially uh, useful for editors? That's a very good question. Um, what an editor would like to see is first a brief summary of what's in the manuscript so that it's clear that you've actually read it. Second thing is point out whether the overall thing makes sense or does not make sense. Is this, uh, is this interesting? Is this novel? Does this make sense? Um, in in a one or two sentences, so for instance, uh, I really like this idea. It seems like nice work. Uh, or uh, this is this work is reasonably flawed or it's fundamentally flawed or I have some issues with that. So that's very clear, obvious um, what your opinion is. And then provide the background for why you think this is good or bad. So for instance, uh, if you think that uh, a lot of necessary references are missing, if people haven't cited correct work, then you say, um, references are missing on the following topics uh, and should be fixed. But then also keep in mind, it helps if you try to be constructive. So then provide some PubMed IDs and say, for instance, the following work at least should have been cited and then two or three PubMed IDs, or if it's really bad, 15 PubMed IDs, right? So um, substantiate your comments with evidence. If you say um, this particular data analysis step was really bad, explain why you think it's bad. If you think this particular uh, experiment was done poorly, explain why you think it was done poorly. Don't just mention things like, this was done poorly, I don't like the scholarship, and figure six is crap, because that doesn't tell anybody anything. Yeah. So say, it's crap because blah. And if you want to be constructive, say, make it better by doing X. Yeah. Um, and so that, that essentially is a good reviewer comment. And also, you know, if you, possibly can, don't make the reviewer comment longer than the manuscript. Uh, sometimes this is necessary, but not always. So the, the editor would like to get some good feedback. Finally, use the um, uh, comments to editor box. In the comments to editor box, you can very clearly state what you really think. You can say, for instance, I said reject and I mean it. Definitely don't go forward with this. It's one of the worst things ever. Yeah? Uh, or say something like, I said major revisions, but see what the other reviewers think because I might not be that qualified. This kind of stuff is extremely useful as well. So provide the kind of information that will help the editor quickly understand what's going on and shows that you know what you're talking about. The bulk of the questions have been asked. I would like to end uh, by saying that uh, this has been recorded, this webinar. We will put it uh, online, I guess, probably YouTube. Um, we will send out an email with more detailed information so that you can share with anybody else uh, you think might be interested. Um, and obviously, since you're uh, probably all in the um, emailing list, you know about the other things that are going on, how we're working towards UPA. We hear uh, that you can still register. So uh, the UPA 2018 meeting, uh, we will be doing quite a bit there. So, um, and it's all going to be in line with this, this uh, kind of webinar, our mentoring day and meet the experts. It's all about getting young uh, scientists, um, yeah, to see where, where they are heading actually. Um, so with no other messages left here, I would like to thank Leonard once more for taking the time to do this for us and uh, sharing his insights. And I want to thank everybody else for attending. I'll see you next time.